coming up on Market to Market. An international team of scientists works to eradicate a disease capable of decimating poultry in developing nations. And scientists in the Obama administration release some dire predictions on the impact of climate change. Those stories and market analysis with Sue Martin, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, May 9 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. The Senate moved closer to a showdown over the proposed Keystone XL pipeline this week. Senators voted 79-20 to take up an energy efficiency bill that Keystone supporters want to amend with language authorizing immediate construction of the controversial oil pipeline from Canada to the United States. Lawmakers from both sides of the aisle also support a measure to speed approval of terminals to export liquefied natural gas. And Republican senators have prepared other amendments to the energy bill, including one that would block the EPA from imposing new limits on greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants. That debate will likely be contentious, especially in the wake of the Obama administration's release this week of a peer-reviewed scientific report which sounded the alarm on the predicted impact of climate change. Those who are already feeling the effects of climate change don't have time to deny it. They're busy dealing with it. Farmers see crops wilted one year, washed away the next, and higher food prices get passed on to you, the American consumer. As a president, as a father, and as an American, I'm here to say we need to act. Those words, spoken at Georgetown University nearly a year ago, kicked off President Obama's National Climate Action Plan, an effort to evaluate and implement solutions regarding the impact of climate change across the nation. Holy moly, all right. And this week, the White House outlined some of the findings with its third National Climate Assessment. This is a, a congressionally mandated report. It comes out every five years or so. It's five years in the making. It's 840 pages. And it's to say, what is climate change doing to America? Other reports look globally. This is looking specifically at the United States and, and drills down into regions, eight different regions in the United States. And essentially it's saying it's, it's here, it's changing America, thinking of America the beautiful sort of becoming America, the stormy, the sneezy, and the dangerous. The research began in 2012 and was conducted by nearly 300 scientists and government officials. It was examined rigorously by experts and members of the public, and after scrutinizing the report, the National Academy of Sciences called it reasonable and a valuable resource. According to the researchers, long-term independent records from weather stations, satellites, and other data sources confirm that the U.S., like the rest of the world, is warming due to the release of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions caused by human activity. One of the ways this report talks about most affecting our daily lives are, is in the extreme weather, the heat waves, the storms, the droughts, the downpours. The climate assessment reports wide-ranging changes in every region of the country. They include economic effects like the billions of dollars spent on disaster relief. While some of these variances may yield short-term benefits, such as longer growing seasons in the Midwest, many more climate shifts are detrimental. And the Obama administration cautions against inactivity in the face of such data. On the whole, summers are longer and hotter, with longer periods of extended heat. Wildfires start earlier in the spring and continue later into the fall. Rain comes down in heavier downpours. People are experiencing changes in the length and severity of seasonal allergies. And climate disruptions to water resources and agriculture have been increasing. The Obama administration is using this to say, OK, we're going to act on climate change. But many of the actions require congressional approval. And that's not getting anywhere so far. The report was not without critics. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky said Obama was likely to, quote, use the platform to renew his call for a national energy tax. 
and I'm sure he'll get loud cheers from liberal elites from the kind of people who leave a giant carbon footprint and then lecture everybody else about low-flow toilets. In his first term, President Obama proposed a system that capped emissions and allowed companies to trade carbon pollution credits. But Congress failed to approve cap and trade, and the president has not called for a specific tax on fossil fuel emissions. All these people are talking about the world coming to an end. Republican Senator James Inhofe of Oklahoma, an outspoken critic of anthropogenic global warming, meaning climate change caused by humans, echoed fossil fuel industry reaction to the National Climate Assessment. The whole idea of this report by design is to spark fear in the American people so they'll go along with the administration in implementing their policies that will kill fossil fuels and leave us with nothing but a broken economy. We are dependent upon fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, for 75% of the energy to run America. Then what's going to happen to our economy if we extract 75%? Well, I think we all know logically what's going to happen. The dreaded virus known as porcine epidemic diarrhea, or PED, is decimating America's swine industry. The virus thrives in cold weather, so the death toll in the U.S. soared this past winter. Data vary significantly on just how many pigs have died, but the USDA estimated recently that PED has played a major role in shrinking the nation's herd by 3% to about 63 million pigs. So far, there is no cure or an effective treatment. And when the virus hits pig nurseries, reports of 90 to 100 percent mortality rates for swine less than 10 days old are common. Biological threats, of course, are not uncommon in livestock production, but it has been a decade since the U.S. last experienced a major outbreak of a poultry virus called Newcastle disease. Some developing nations, on the other hand, routinely battle outbreaks which have the potential to wipe out 75 percent of infected flocks. But an international team of scientists is working to breed a variety of chicken that is more resistant to the virus. Paul Yeager explains. Scientists from the United States and Africa are teaming up to combat a disease capable of decimating a region's poultry population. Newcastle disease, the stronger forms of which can kill more than half of unvaccinated birds, can be particularly difficult for producers in developing nations. In most cases, the real target for this work is going to be the smallholder farmers and the villagers. And so they're really having quite marginal uh, both economics and nutrition uh, within their family. And so if they lose half of a good protein source that they were going to depend on for that whole year, it's extremely devastating. The U.S. Agency for International Development's Feed the Future program has awarded the scientists a $6 million grant. The team will study the genetic makeup of various chickens to determine what particular genes make some poultry more resistant to Newcastle disease, the number one health issue affecting poultry production in Africa. Newcastle disease is a respiratory illness. Its symptoms include swelling around the eyes and twisting of the head and neck. The virus causes only mild symptoms in humans, namely pink eye. According to the World Animal Health Information database, nearly 150,000 chickens and other domestic birds died of Newcastle disease over the past two years. Another 1.5 million were destroyed or sent to the slaughterhouse to prevent the spread of the disease, which is highly contagious in birds. Cyprus, Israel, and Libya are among the countries affected recently. The last outbreak in the United States, just over a decade ago, affected poultry in Arizona, California, Nevada, and Texas. More than three million U.S. birds had to be destroyed. Live bird markets, such as this one, filmed by the research team in Tanzania in early 2014, bring poultry from various villages into contact, helping spread the disease. The weaker forms can be relatively well controlled with vaccination uh, and routinely in the U.S. vaccines are used to protect poultry uh, against this disease. But in developing parts of the world, there's not enough infrastructure or there may not even be the pennies needed to buy uh, a vaccine to protect the birds. 
In addition to Iowa State University, the five-year study includes scientists from the University of California, Davis, the University of Delaware, and in Africa, Sokoine University of Agriculture in Tanzania and the University of Ghana. The team will first study two lines of chickens, leghorn, which are commonly used for egg production in the United States and are more susceptible to Newcastle disease, and fayumi, which have origins in Egypt and are relatively resistant to the virus. Researchers are trying to pinpoint the combination of traits that appear to correspond with greater resistance. They will then analyze the DNA of individual chickens to understand how these seemingly relevant traits are passed on genetically. So once we have uh, information on which, what genetics uh, provides greater resistance to the disease, then we can go out and, and screen chickens and find the ones that have the right genes and then use those to breed the next generation of chickens. The scientists are looking for the same genetic makeup among African flocks in Africa to avoid introducing a breed which may not be as well adapted to the environment or with which African farmers may be unfamiliar. The team plans to also consider the chickens' resistance to heat and drought. They are interested in being sure that agriculture is ready to respond to uh, the climate change which we anticipate is coming. Uh, which will probably have more heat episodes in them. Scientists say this type of genomics work will likely lead to greater precision when breeding all kinds of livestock. It is a new field, but it's very rapidly uh, developing. Um, you know, the human genome was sequenced, uh, the chicken genome was sequenced in 2004. The chicken was the first livestock species that, for which we got the whole genome decoded. Um, so, I mean, it's all within the last decade that things have started, but it's developing very, very quickly. Feed the Future, a U.S. government global hunger and food security initiative, is trying to emphasize genomics research in both crops and livestock. We have had livestock and animal science research in our portfolio for many years. However, recently we wanted to increase our investment in the animal science area, and so this year we awarded two new Feed the Future Innovation Labs, one focused on poultry and one focused on a livestock vaccine. And it's an area we're considering and thinking about how to strengthen our investments to ensure that, that households across the countries where we work have access to uh, foods that are really, that have that high density of nutrition. In this case, the more resistant chickens will be provided to villagers in Africa, typically in association with a school. The children, as well as local women, will be trained on proper care of the birds. Livestock in general, not just poultry, are kind of uh, sort of a, an investment. They're kind of, um, you can almost see them as a, a walking bank account. African women are more likely to be responsible for poultry rather than large livestock, and this research may ultimately help protect a source of income important to them and their families. Increasing our investments in, in productivity of, of animals and of fish is a way to both address nutrition, but also recognizes that animals are often a major asset to a household. And if they can increase the numbers of, of, of particular small animals that they keep, that gives them some resilience to, to economic stress. Uh, the importance is of, of, of having animals that can produce and can survive diseases is as great, if not greater, for the smallholder families than uh, compared to our industry because their livelihoods depend on it. Now, it's the same in, in, in North America, but it's life and death for, uh, for, for their children. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. Next, the Market to Market Report. Grain futures contracts posted modest gains this week as the trade pondered the latest numbers on supply and demand and the potential for spring planting to kick into high gear in the days ahead. For the week, July wheat gained seven cents, while the nearby corn contract moved eight cents higher. Tight supplies continued to be friendly to old crop soybeans as the July contract gained 16 cents. The nearby meal contract followed suit with a gain of nearly $7 per ton. 
In the softs, cotton broke its three-week rally as the July contract declined by $1.96 per hundredweight. In the dairy market, May Class Three milk lost a penny, while the deferred contract gave up 30 cents per hundred. Over in livestock, the June cattle contract was unchanged, while August feeders continued their record-breaking rally with a gain of more than a dollar. But the June lean hog contract lost over two dollars. In the financials, the euro lost 12 basis points against the dollar. Crude oil advanced by 23 cents per barrel. Comex Gold lost $15.30 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index declined by nearly three points to settle at 648.40. Here now, to lend us her insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Sue Martin. Sue, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. We're excited to have you here. We're excited to have you here, of course, on uh, the day USDA released its uh, latest supply and demand reports. Let's take a look at the wheat market this week. What did we see old crop wheat? Well, first off, the um, ending supply or carryout was lowered more than most traders thought. We've seen a reduction in soft, we've seen a reduction in uh, the hard red, and also in the um, uh, spring wheat as well. So I think that um, when I look at the wheat market, here's a market that started off last as it went into dormancy under the best conditions that we hadn't seen in years. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's like that saying, it's not over till the fat lady sings. Well, this one, you know, is just in that boat. Uh, we've seen a, a market that, uh, a crop that came out of dormancy and just continued to hit demise. Um, we're looking at winter wheat this coming Monday, probably showing the Kansas crop again with another 7, 8% decline. Had a 10%, I think 9 or 10% decline last week. And so, you know, some say, well, but we've priced in where the wheat crop is for now. Well, if that's the case, then we're only gonna catch our breath for a moment because wheat has a bull flag on the charts, it has a double bottom on the weekly charts, and it also has a head and shoulders bottom on the daily charts. So I look at this market and think, no, nah, it's going higher. And you know, the one thing about the wheat market is it's about $3 over the price of corn. And when you look at wheat being so premium in the cash market over corn, you know, that market, what it is, is it's kind of in a little world of its own. The commercials love to carry a supply or a reserve of, of wheat because they get the um, uh, carrying charges out of it. And they continue to have carrying charges in that market. So they like that. But So the demand's good for the wheat in that respect. But exports are good as well. Wheat's uh, carrying a very good percentage for, you know, and of course we're coming almost into the end of the year, so, you know, because of that, we're running ahead of normal. In fact, corn, soybeans, and wheat are all running ahead of normal for what the USDA normally uh, would predict at this time and where our pace would be in percentage-wise. But when you look at the wheat market, and our stocks are tightening in the U.S. Now, Canada, Grana, has a big crop. But you got to ask yourself, what price is it going to take to move wheat from many or from Canada down to Kansas? Not going to happen unless we go sharply higher. Now you've got because the price has really gotten better over corn, you're going to have an increase in wheat plantings probably in Argentina. You look at the Ukraine. Ukrainian corn is probably going to decline this year. But we got to remember the Ukraine used to be. They've got some good ground over there but they also tend to be in a drier climate. And that's why they used to always raise wheat. But when you had corn prices up around seven to $8, it just sort of enhanced that program and they lucked out and had an awesome year last year. That's not gonna happen this year. Okay. So I think wheat has higher to go. Would I tell a producer to be selling it right now? Probably not. Uh, soft red wheat, Chicago wheat, did make a 6.18% retracement of its from its contract high to its contract low. Um, so it's natural you would hesitate here on that. You look at uh, the uh, KC wheat, we got within seven cents, I believe, of the highs of a year ago. The May contract set new highs over a year ago. So I think the program is, is in good shape. We're running counter-seasonal. That keeps people trying to pick spots to sell. That's been good for the market. 
Uh, but I still think we've got higher to go on the KC wheat. I think KC wheat's going to $9 plus. All right. All right, a little bullish note there to end the wheat segment. Now, let's talk about corn. You did say that we're, the Argentinians probably aren't going to be seeing $7 corn. What do you see for Americans as we take a look? Let's talk old crop corn first. We saw the, a reduction in, in, uh, in stocks there on the USDA report. Is that going to have much of an impact on this market through the remainder of summer? Well, I think so. Um, you know, the traders, you know, the, a lot of these analysts, I want to say, I shouldn't say this, but are stupid bearish. They, they just look at the face value. They don't dig into the, um, all the fundamentals and the, the reasons behind them. They just look at face value of what's out there in supply. They forget to talk about what's going to happen in usage. And in the meantime, you look at corn and they say, well, you know, exports or feed usage is going to be up at, around the world globally. Well, you know what? You look at Europe. Are they going to feed $8 plus wheat? I don't think so. They're going to feed corn. So they're going to import corn, feed corn, and they're going to export wheat is what they're going to do. And so when you look at the old crop corn, we have the USDA increase their carry or, um, uh, export number to 1.9 billion bushels. Well, I think the USDA woke up. We have a huge export package or book on the exporter's hands. And come June, July, and August, those exporters are going to be busy exporting corn. They're going to compete against the uh, ethanol plants who are making good money and are also after that corn. But I think this corn's got a home going, and they're going to be bidding for that cash corn because they have to fulfill those orders. All right. Now, the bear will say, well, but you've got 580, I think 589,000 metric tons of corn yet to go to China that hasn't been shipped yet. And you've got 4 million metric tons that hasn't shipped yet to unknown destinations. So we don't think we're going to get that 1.9 billion bushels. Well, I don't agree with that. That's corn that yet that's still unshipped. But like I say, we have three and a half months plus to get that done. All right. Well, now let's take a look at new crop. And Sue, as you know, every every week on the on the internet, we do the Market Plus segment where we take yes. the, the questions from viewers via Twitter and Facebook. And we've got one this week on new crop corn. We thought we'd ask it during the program. Uh, William in Hiawatha, Kansas, is confused on the corn market as we look at new crop. He says, is $5 enough or is it possible to get to six or to four? What's more realistic? Six. All right. Well, not everybody agrees with me. But when you look at this new crop corn, first off, we've, yes, we've got planting taken off. What happens? Corn goes up. Everybody thought, oh, corn's going to fall down. They sell into it, but the market goes up. They had every reason they wanted to today to be able to sell that market and break it and close the week lower. Did they do it? No, they couldn't get it done. I think that, yeah, the daily charts are vulnerable. We have the market a little bit overbought. You have spent, what, three weeks, four weeks in a range here on corn? You don't top a market that way. We're just killing time, another stair step to move it higher. Uh, 521 on December corn was a minor wave three. We got to 517. So we're just kind of digesting that, but we're going to go higher. You have huge gaps above this market in continuation. On the July, from 552 to a little over $7. That's huge. And then you've got it on the Dece corn as well, maybe not quite as big, I think 632 to 710 or something like that. All right. So I think corn's going higher. I think $6 is probably going to be realistic, but you've got to get over the 573. That was last June's high on December corn contracts. So I think we got to get over that. And this year's Dece corn, I think, got to 579. So once we clear that, I think the doors open and then we'll start pushing stronger. But I think we're going higher. All right. Well, real quick, let's take a look at the soybean market and let's talk new crop soybeans. Didn't see much of a move this week, relatively fat, flat at, at three cents up. Where do you see us going on the new crop side? Well, I think I forgot to take my my horns off because I'm very bullish. Okay. Um, I think beans also have the potential on new crop to go higher. Um, I think that uh, first off, when you look at years ending in a four, it's a pattern, but years ending in a four from 1914, every one of them has made new highs for, from the year before on a new crop bean contract. Furthermore, just because we have all this production in South America and now looking at the U.S., but looking at March 1st stocks in years when the Western Hemisphere's March 1st stocks increased from the year before by 4.8 million metric tons or greater, there's been 14 of them since 1976. Ten of those November beans made new highs. 
the other four, they tested the highs. Um, I think you look at these new crop beans. Yeah, at some point we're going to say, gee, we're going to have some beans coming out of South America. You know, the, the one thing everybody's been so bearish about and tried to push is all these uh, imports that we're going to have. Well, guess what? Maybe those imports just don't make it here. China's back already buying in South America. So those Brazilian beans, it would be only natural that stocks would go up in Brazil and Argentina. You know, the Argentine farmer isn't selling and he's harvesting right now. And then you've got in Brazil some of those cancellations, so those beans are sitting there. But just maybe those beans don't make it here because with China stepping in and starting to buy, well, guess what? All of a sudden, you start seeing that, that value of beans in Brazil start escalating, and all of a sudden that commercial is going to say, you know what, we don't need them in the U.S. We'll keep them down there. All right. And now we'll talk. We had a big move up in old crop beans. We'll talk about that on the Market Plus segment on the website. Let's take a look at the cattle market. Fat cattle didn't move at all this week, unchanged. What does that tell you where we're going? Well, I think with the uh, fat market, you know, we're looking at the feeders. We, we're congesting here. And a lot of times you'll get a, a market that'll hold after Easter. You get that little post-Easter rally. And then the market tends to peak and, you know, you've got your Memorial Day weekend buying done, and then the market slips off and sells off. So there's a little bit of a seasonal there. But I think what we've got going in this cattle market is we're holding back heifers, and that's very friendly to feeder cattle. That's what's been holding the feeder market up. And so as we hold back heifers, I think it's also going to push up your October cattle and December cattle, All right. especially the October. So we might be surprised what's in underneath that October futures. Okay. And now real quick on the hogs, you see this downward trend continuing? Well, I think the hog market, as we go towards June, can be a kind of an ebb and flow market. Not like a normal June market would be. Um, years tend to be like that when you have a late Easter, and we had one, but this market really priced itself, and yet, if you looked at exports, phenomenal Very strong. on pork. You All bet, right. and beef. Thank you so much, Sue. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market, but Sue and I will continue our discussion and answer more of your questions in our Market Plus segment online. You'll also find audio podcasts and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed, Facebook page, and the rest of our social media outlets exclusively at the Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when we'll examine efforts to improve water quality in a leading farm state. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.